Michael Beschloss has been called the nation's leading presidential historian by Newsweek, author of nine books on presidential history, including the New York Times bestsellers Presidential Courage, The Conquerors, two volumes on Lyndon Johnson's White House tapes. He's NBC News presidential historian, uh, contributor to PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, and his latest book is... <laughs> Is You've got one of those? President, <laughs> right there. Anyone to toss us a book? Uh, Presidents of War. Right. Yeah. Michael, I like um, folks to get a feel for the person. There's the work, there's the ideas, there's the book and so on, but could you briefly talk about your path? How does one become a presidential historian? Well, in this case, I mean, there actually was a, a specific moment which, as they say in Texas, this story has the added advantage of being true, not always. Uh, <laughs> Do you found that, find that, but how many here from Illinois by any chance? Yeah, well, a few. In fact, we saw each other a little bit earlier. I think it is still the case that in Illinois, it's almost a law that parents have to take their kids to the Abraham Lincoln sites in Springfield around the age of eight, so I was taken to those. And I remember going to Lincoln's house in Springfield. It's much better preserved nowadays than it was in those days. And I was shown the chair that Lincoln sat in when he read to his children. And, you know, I was eight years old. I wish I could tell you that I, I asked the guide, what were Lincoln's views of civil liberties? Or, <laughs> you know, what do you think of the house divided speech or something? But I was eight years old, so I said, when Lincoln's children misbehaved, did he spank them? And as I remember, the guide said with this disgusted look, no, can you believe it? Lincoln didn't believe in discipline. He just let those brats run wild through this house. And I heard that Lincoln was my man. I began <laughs> reading all about Lincoln, serious, true story, and about other presidents. And then later on, where I grew up, I don't think I ever met anyone who had written a book until I was about 15 years old. But I found out that actually you could do that for a living. And so that had a lot to do with my getting into this line of work. So it, it wasn't just the slaves he freed, it was his kids as well. Yeah, his <laughs> kids, and, and that's the way you relate to you know, kids of that age. And uh, it turned out to be something that I actually still enjoy doing yeah. low, low these decades later. Yeah. Um, how did this particular book happen? This, I had written a lot of books that dealt with individual presidents and individual wars, and I always wanted to write one book that went through 200 years and also talked about the eight or nine people who had started major wars as a category. I mean, this is the one reason I call this presidents of war rather than presidents at war or something like that. And the idea is that eight or nine people, you know, it's largely a biography. It's their story that they shared an experience that no other American has had, which is to take the country into major wars with lots of casualties. Uh, and there are some similarities. Uh, not a small number of them have emotional breakdowns from the experience. They almost all become religious. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, for instance, when he was a young man in Illinois, was almost an atheist. And one of his friends from youth came to visit him in Washington when the Civil War was wearing on and found Lincoln reading the Bible and said, I can't believe that I'm seeing you here reading a Bible. It's so unlike what you were early in your life. And Lincoln said, you just can't imagine what this experience is like causing the deaths of so many people. I can't understand how someone could be a war president and not become more religious. Uh, another thing is all of them had empathy. Uh, not a bad even, thing. Even, the, even Polk. Even Polk, uh, <laughs> compared to Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> James Polk was a pillar of empathy. Uh, although you're right in saying that Polk was probably pretty low on the <laughs> empathy o meter. But, you know, Lincoln, the best of it. Lincoln said, uh, for instance, there was a story that, true story, that Lincoln was told that. There were so many people dying in the Civil War that they had to build a new national cemetery. And his people said, where do you want it? And Lincoln said, build it near my summer house. You know, in those days, a president would have a summer house 
up the hill from the White House because in those days, the president's office was on the second floor of the White House and you'd, Lincoln would come out of his bedroom with his nightcap and long gown and there'd be 90 people in the hallway wanting jobs for their brothers-in-law or something else. So he took his family every summer for four months to this small cottage up the hill from the White House, about two miles. And so he said, build the National Cemetery near my summer house because I want to, every time I go there, see the graves of Union soldiers being dug. And he said, this is gonna be very painful for me, but while I'm making all these decisions le leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of young Americans, I want to see the tangible evidence of what I'm doing because I don't want to get disconnected from that experience. Richard Nixon, by contrast, when he was a war president in the Vietnam War, said, I want to think of the soldiers like chess pieces. Wow. I don't want to get too emotionally involved. I want it to be almost like mathematics. That's the other end of the scale. Yeah. I'd want a Lincoln as my war president <laughs> yeah. for, for that and other reasons. So you say you wanted to bring them together. You wanted to look at the differences and the similarities and the threads and so on. And figure out what emotionally that experience was like. In fact, one other thing I haven't mentioned is that most of them, since we're talking about we haven't yet had a woman president yet, astoundingly, they almost all had strong marriages. I mean, Lyndon Johnson during the Vietnam War, I am not qualified by training, but he sure seemed like a person who had big bipolar tendencies. Very subject to depression, you know, depressions which for days he would pull the covers over his head, got too excited when there was good news or unnerving news, and his wife, Lady Bird Johnson, everyone knows a little bit about her. I got to know her very well in her later years because I was doing these books, books on, on the tapes. tapes. Yeah, these on the tapes. And she was tuned into him, basically made it possible for, not only for him to get through the presidency, but all of us, you know, and it's one of the themes of the book, it's we're in a dangerous situation because our lives and the lives of much of the human race depend on the stability and the character of the person who is president of the United States, especially tonight. <laughs> uh, and I'm saying this really seriously. He can launch nuclear weapons that could kill 60 million people in a couple of hours. I mean, that's what we got to at the end of the 200 years, which is partly the story I'm telling. So, anything that makes a president more stable is a good thing, and Lady Brew Johnson did. Eleanor Roosevelt had this famously bad marriage, which got really bad during World War I when she found that her husband Franklin was having an affair with her social secretary. And see, she basically said, all right, we're not gonna have a real marriage from this point onward, but I share Franklin's political ideals, so at least I'll be his political partner. And in 1942, a couple of months after Pearl Harbor, he was considering interning Japanese Americans, sending them all to concentration camps. She said, you cannot do this, even J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI says that it isn't necessary for national security. One day he told her he was doing it anyway, her friends said that, that from that moment, the marriage really ended because she could not, as I tell the story, she couldn't continue to kid herself that mm -hmm. at least they shared political ideals. She felt that anyone who could do that, this was someone she really didn't understand. And that's one of the reasons you hear the stories that Eleanor is constantly traveling during World War II. A lot of the reason for that was that she found something really bad about her husband that sort of really ended the marriage. Anyway, sorry for the long answer. No, no, minutes, I was gonna point out, I, I, I actually mentioned backstage to Michael that this kind of book is the most difficult ones to do sure an interview is. about. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, a book of... <laughs> no, that's, no, it was interesting to write. Interesting hard, to write, interesting hard, to read. Hard to be interviewed on. The reason so. is, if a book is about ideas, 
then we talk about the ideas. A book like this is really about the stories. Right. Uh, what a historian does is fill in, flesh out the, the stories. And, and really Tell, should, because anyone had history teachers who made history uh, boring? Uh, <laughs> And part of that was by just trying to deny, deny that, you know, the way that we human beings take in information, you know, you tell about what happened to you yesterday, you don't say, I'm going to deliver the five most important pa parts about my day yesterday, here they are. But I, I, um, I, I want to take a moment then to say, what is, what is the work? that goes into, this book took you 10 years. Mm -hmm. What is that process? And you guys really took your life into your hands by coming to hear me tonight. Right? <laughs> Someone who took 10 years writing a 700 page book. Better. But I, I will stay within time. I'll a little about the stuff. historian's process, not when you're teaching it, but yeah. when you're, when you're well, this is, doing this. This is a book that is based, I hope, every page on new documents and new archives. So it's one reason it took so long. I mean, for instance, it's the story of these presidents waging wars, but also about other people who were not president. Case in point. Everyone know about how the Spanish War began. There was a, a ship called the Maine that was sunk in Havana Harbor. And so I tell the story of the captain of the ship whose name was Charles Sigsby. And uh, he was a huge egotist, uh, so self-centered that the night the ship was sunk and hundreds of his men had been killed, he sends a telegram to his wife, which I found in his archive, which is in Albany, in New York, Albany, New York. And he says, uh, the ship was sunk tonight, about whatever the number was, 200 people killed. And plus, I lost my, my whole wardrobe, which I'll now have to replace. Uh, this is someone who had a little bit of an emotional problem. But you only find those things if you dig. You know, like I was talking about Eleanor Roosevelt. There was a letter that she wrote in about 1935 that gives you a sense of her marriage, which I was talking about a little bit. She writes to a friend a long letter, and in that letter is one sentence, which is something like 1935. More and more, I'm coming to understand that Franklin is a great man, comma, but he treats me like a stranger. Now, one sentence in one letter, if you knew nothing about that marriage, that one sentence really takes you into it. So what I tried to do was get letters and diaries and documents that people had not seen before and tell the story in a new way. And that's a big reason it took so long, because I do that kind of stuff myself. A, because I like it, and B, if I could find some great research assistant, which I've never been able to do, who could do that with the same aims that I have, I just don't think, I, I'd, you, be, I'd be subcontracting. You said, which I do myself. There are some of your colleagues, some of your peers. Who Use it, and they do it well. And, and they have someone who. And, and do it, and they found brilliant people wow. who can do it. But I've never been able to do it well. And also, it's like reporters who are promoted to management, oh. and they hate their lives. What they really loved was being reporters. Well, one thing I like is going through the documents and yes. finding letters like that, so it wouldn't be fun for me. You can do it for 10 years because you actually enjoy that process. Absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, again, I'm staying with the process a little bit. I've written screenplays. I've written of some other stuff. I think of creativity, like so many other things in nature, as having an expansion phase and a contraction phase, right. like our heart, exactly. like our lungs. Right. How, how big does it get? And how hard is it to well, bring it, it back? Well, it has to be because if you're trying, if you're doing research, for instance, you go into an archive and you wind up reading letters of other people that you weren't really intending to, but there's going to be a piece of gold there, and uh, or a document. For instance, one thing I found, it was probably the the largest piece of news that was in the book. It was there was a piece. The first thing to appear on this book was on the front page of the Sunday New York Times which I'm not saying in a gloating way, but just to say how surprising this was to me because this is a book about mainly about nine dead white guys. Uh, who, yeah, how could it be news? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very dead. And what happened was, in turned out in January of 1968, and actually one, one example of man bites dog, 
I found something nice to say about Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam, which takes some doing, because I have a lot of very bad things to say about him. But in January of 1968, uh, we were about four years into the big escalation in Vietnam, and there were half a million Americans in Vietnam. And Johnson's commander was a guy, people might remember the name, William Westmoreland. Not the most brilliant gen general I've encountered in American history by a long shot. And Westmoreland asks Johnson secretly, why don't we consider using nuclear weapons in Vietnam to end the war in victory? which would require our moving them there from Guam and Okinawa because you do not keep nuclear weapons in a live theater in Korea. There were not nuclear weapons in South Korea because it was too dangerous. So the request gets to Johnson who basically goes batshit and he's saying, you know, I do not want to, I've spent four years trying to keep this war from going nuclear. Uh, we do this, you're gonna bring in the Russians and Chinese that could, this could be a nuclear war fast, so not only am I saying no, but let's lock up every single piece of paper related to this request because I don't want some general leaking it to some newspaper saying that Johnson is avoiding a way that could end the war mm. immediately. And the result was that the documents were locked up, some of them until 2016, so I was doing research in the documents in the Johnson Library, and you sort of figure, how much does there remain to be known? And it had been known that this request had been made, but not the way that Johnson responded to it. So I found documents that were only released in 2016 because this was still, still sensitive. And I talked to a guy named Tom Johnson, who was not a relation to LBJ, but in those days he was a young man uh, and he was the one who kept the notes in some of these secret meetings, and so he knew things that went beyond these documents. He later on was the publisher of the LA Times in the late 1980s and became CEO of CNN after that. Yeah. Is now basically retired in Atlanta and has not talked about this very much, so was able to find some news about this. But the point I'm making is that if I had sent even a great research assistant to the Johnson Library, they might not quite have realized what they were seeing and what turned out to be a really important part of the book might not have yeah. happened. Very good, So that, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, no, this is good. Um, one of the key points you make in the evolution over the 200 years is, first of all, the founders' intentions and then how we've... They never wanted a president to start a war single-handedly or to have the ability. And they worked hard to make sure that wouldn't happen. Because anybody, anybody here taken a look at the Constitution lately? I suggest that in these times we read the Constitution nightly, <laughs> uh, twice, uh, and I hope there is one in a couple of years, and I'm not saying that jokingly. Uh, but one thing that the founders were worried about was how did the kings of England maintain their popularity? Well, sometimes if they got unpopular, they'd fabricate a reason for an unnecessary war, and the country would go to war, and everyone would unite behind the king, and the result was that this was a weapon of absolute power. Well, the founders were trying to create a society that was the opposite of that, so they wanted to make sure that presidents could not single-handedly get us into unnecessary wars, so, Anyone who has taken a look at that wonderful document lately, wars are declared not by presidents, but by Congress. But, and I tell this as part of the story, when was the last time that Congress declared war in American history? Uh, 1942, exactly. Uh, question two, have we had any wars since 1942? <laughs> We've had a few. I'll say question three, yeah. have we won one since then? Uh, Exactly. We won a modest war, Desert Storm, but with that exception, and I don't think of that as a major no. war because there are about 200 right. people get ultim dead ultimately, uh, exactly right. So the founders wanted to make sure that Congress was in on this. And can I tell the story at the beginning of the book? Yes. Uh, I have dispensation from Terrence to tell at least one story that the, the way I open the book is 
uh, August 1814, and the president was Madison. And Madison is galloping through the wet, dark forest of Virginia at night. And the question occurs, what was he doing there? <laughs> and he gets off this horse uh, and turns around and looks at Washington, D.C. And what he was doing there was he was escaping the British who were burning the Capitol and were burning the White House. This was two years into the War of 1812. We were losing. And Madison was escaping because they were trying to find him to hang him as a battle trophy. And so he was on the lam. He was a fugitive. And his beloved, vivacious wife, Dolly, was also running through the forest, escaping in her own way. They were trying to find each other, and they didn't know where they were. They, at this point, they thought they might not see each yeah. other again. But to his own danger, Mad Madison keeps on getting off his horse, turning around, and he's completely absorbed by the sight of Washington across the Potomac River, disappearing in a swirl of fire, for which he knew that he was responsible right. because he was one of the founders who yep. said in the Constitution, you know, no unnecessary wars and only wars that are supported by the people. And as it turns out, he was the one who asked Congress in, in 1812 to get into the War of 1812. We were two years in, as, and as I say, we were losing. He knew he was responsible and I actually said it in an early version that I, I took out for various reasons, but I do believe that his fate of running hard to escape death was rough justice for his doing this terrible thing of being, despite the fact that he was a founder, the first president to get us involved in a war that was unnecessary. Two questions for you all. What was the most unpopular war in American history, it wasn't Vietnam, it was War of 1812. Really? What was the first war we lost? It was not the war in Vietnam, it was the War of 1812. But you wouldn't know that because it was spun by Madison and his successors as this wonderful victory, Star Spangled Banner, Andrew Jackson at New Orleans, you know, don't give up the ship, all this stuff which made it seem like a victory, but we didn't do what we got into it for, which was A, get the Brits to stop bothering our ships, B, steal Canada. Canada is still independent, we lost. <laughs> um, so at that point, his sin, sort of, as you say, is original, that- Really is, original sin. Yeah, right? is that he went to Congress and said, Let's do this. At that point, they're still asking Congress. Yeah, so he gets a, uh, he gets a gold star for that. <laughs> but he was trying to sell a war that he never should have asked right. for, and almost half the Congress was against it, and almost half the country. If it was Mad you know, Madison, the founder, good. Madison, the president, not so much. Yeah, and in conflict with himself. Yeah. So Polk, the 1840s, so now that war, so now we're like 25 years later. Right, right? liars, liars, scoundrel, and bully. Uh, Donald Trump does have some precedents in history, yeah. <laughs> and, and Polk fabricates, yes? Total fake. Uh, Polk wanted a war with Mexico. Had a wonderful aim, which was a secret aim. He never told it to anyone, especially not Congress. His aim was to acquire almost a million square miles of land uh, from Mexico, which included the land that we're sitting on tonight. Uh, we'd be sitting in Mexico if it weren't for Polk, so he gets you know some credit for that. But or uh, <laughs> depends. Right, depends. Yeah, if, yes. you, if you'd prefer to be in Mexico, Polk <laughs> is not your man. Right. But he did it by lying and cheating and and fabricating a fake incident. He fabricated a fake border incident in southern Texas with the Mexicans, then went to Congress and said, the Mexicans have attacked us. We have to have a major war with Texas. And he says in his diary, you know, I lied to this senator and I lied to this member of cabinet. He was proud of it, but got Congress to support this big war with Mexico, went on for two years, almost, marched to Mexico City but the real reason was something that he totally lied about, which was 
he wanted all this land to get from Mexico when the peace was won, that would make us a coast-to-coast -coast nation, which as I say, you know, with every president, especially in war, it's always ends versus means. Sometimes the ends are good. I think it's a good thing we're a continental nation, but this was, as I say, a liar who pursued his war in almost a criminal way. You point out that Jefferson did not go to war. Right. Jefferson acquired land yeah. by buying it. Right. Was, was he close to war? Were there temptations? No. Uh, Jefferson was, again, and he's sort of a good, good guy in this book because in 1807, another, war I, uh, another story I tell is about a conflict between two ships, the American ship, the Chesapeake, British ship, the Leopard. The Leopard fired on the Chesapeake and won, and Americans were outraged. And Jefferson said, if I had wanted a war, all I would have had to do was open my hand because Americans were so angry at the Brits. Had he done that, we would have had a war of 18, 1807. And so Jefferson didn't want war, didn't think it was necessary. He was peace-loving, and he wanted to set an example for later presidents. <laughs> and Madison and Polk set the opposite example. So um, again, Polk gets them to declare. What's the, the last, and, and so World War I, Wilson. Was declared by Wilson, who I think was one of the worst presidents in history in terms of war. Why? Uh, any Wilson descendants here tonight? <laughs> uh, it's easy to find a Harding descendant. There are probably a lot of them, not, uh, but no, no Wilson descendants, although we had a daughter in California. Uh, let's begin with the disgusting racism. This is one of the worst racists ever to be president, and that's really saying something. Uh, <laughs> He drove African Americans out of the federal government, despite the fact that he was followed by T.R. and Taft, who were quite advanced. Warren Harding was quite advanced on race. People say Wilson was a man of his time. He was not a man of his time. He was m much more extremely fringe racist than any other president served in that period. So begin with the racism, which does enter into him as a war president because there were a lot of African Americans who wanted to fight. But more than that, and especially bad because he was a hypocrite, Wilson was someone who had this great pretension as a professor and writer of history, as someone who was honest and loved civil liberties. Well, when he became a war president, he hated civil liberties. He passed something called the Espionage Act, which is used to this day by Donald Trump yes. to go after journalists who are trying to write the truth. So that was Wilson on civil liberties. In terms of telling the truth, in 1916, he narrowly won re-election by just a few votes, and it came down to California. And it came down to the women of California who could vote earlier than almost anyone else. Shows what a progressive state this was even then. Even then. And in 1916, women voted for Wilson because anyone know what his slogan was that year? He kept us out of war. Oh, yeah. Another lie. Uh, a, he had been to war with Mexico, so that was a lie. <laughs> Number two, if you got a president running for re-election saying he kept us out of war, the implication is that he's going to keep you out of war in the future, right? Well, Wilson knew that if he was re-elected, he was likely to be in a war in a couple of weeks, so... That was a false thing for him to say. And the lovely women of California, by the evidence we have, they voted for Will Woodrow Wilson in good faith because they were peace-loving and they thought that he would keep them out of war. And they provided the margin that allowed Wilson to become president again. So that was cheating and that something that, and especially for Wilson, who was so pretentious, oh. it just makes me almost sick. Yeah. So if there's a member of the Woodrow Wilson Anti-Defamation League this <laughs> evening, you've got your work cut out for you because I, I don't respect Wilson. It's interesting. And, uh, it seems to me of the, when I remember what I was taught in school uh -huh. of Wilson, right. he was one of the, he wasn't on Rushmore, but he was like yeah. in the second tier, right? It's like weren't we taught that the War of, War of 1812 was a victory and a yeah. great thing to do? I mean, and he yeah. has... He has, well, I, that's I think, why I love writing history because it's great to shatter what we yes. were all told in, yeah. in school. 
And the other thing is that Wilson, you'd think that someone with such high-flown ideas about what presidents should do during the first year America was in World War I, wouldn't you think that, especially, in fact, I gave my chapters on Woodrow Wilson to a famous Wilson scholar who mainly likes Wilson, and it tested our friendship very much. <laughs> uh, and he'd write things in the margins like, all right, I can't persuade you about a lot of this, but would you at least consider taking out the words conceited and messianic? Uh, <laughs> you could see which way I was going. And so Wilson's first year in office, he ba or yet during the war, he basically locked him up in the, himself out in the White House, up in the White House, didn't feel that Americans deserved an explanation of why they were there and what was going on. Until the end of the war, which was exactly 100 years ago in about two weeks from oh, that's now, right. November of 1918, suddenly it's almost surprise the purpose of this war was war to end all wars, make the world safe for democracy, plus League of Nations, which I want the United States to be the centerpiece of. Basically barely gets to any of that until the war is over. And just in terms of competence, very hard to persuade people when you've been so quiet for a year and a half. And so Wilson is trying to get Americans to accept a League of Nations, which I'll speak for both of us, I think we would probably think was a good idea. It would have forestalled the rise of Hitler, maybe forestalled World War II, but Wilson was such an incompetent president that rather than spend the next couple of months explain to, explaining to Americans why it was a good idea. He goes to Paris for months and leaves the argument to his opponents, Henry Cabot Lodge and people like that who are telling Americans it's a terrible idea, don't do it, because Wilson, who was conceited and messianic, <laughs> felt he was the only one who could negotiate the peace treaty in Paris an early example of I alone can fix it. Right. <laughs> Not terribly sim many similarities between Woodrow Wilson and Donald Trump, but here's one. But that's one. And not a good one. Um, so we say Polk started a war on fabrication, as did Lyndon Johnson. And as did McKinley with that ship in Havana Harbor. McKinley said the Spanish sank it. They didn't. It was a boiler accident. You can't go to war against boilers, so McKinley went to war against Spain. Big war in retaliation for an incident that never took place. Lyndon Johnson, even worse, in 1960. And then, of course, Bush and Cheney and yeah, all of that. Yeah, there is a thread here, and can I say a word on Johnson? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Gulf of Tonkin, everyone has heard about that a little bit, maybe a few even remember it. Uh, Johnson went on TV in August of 1964 and said, unprovoked attack against an American ship in the Gulf of Tonkin. And we bombed North Vietnam, we went to Congress, got a resolution to use our armed forces in Southeast Asia, didn't ask for a war declaration, which is the, the fashion since 1942. So on the basis of this flimsy resolution, based on an incident that he quickly knew had never taken place, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon waged a war that lasted for a decade, killed 60,000 Americans. And we now know it never happened. And there is this unfortunate thread in American life, which runs from Polk with a fake Mexican attack to McKinley with a fake attack against the Maine in Havana Harbor which goes to something that, that Franklin Roosevelt was accused of falsely, in my view. He made mistakes that led to Pearl Harbor, but he did not put the ships there, hoping that the Japanese would bomb them and get us into World War II. But by then, Americans were already tuned into the fact that presidents used these fake incidents, that they were suspicious of FDR unnecessarily. Then you get to Lyndon Johnson with the Gulf of Tonkin. And then you get to George W. Bush, weapons of mass destruction that were, turns out, were not there in Iraq as a premise for war. And historians will be arguing well into the future. And 
I don't write about it. Terrence and I were talking about this because I can't write about the war in Iraq as history yet because the documents aren't open and I think you need at least 40 years of hindsight to have, to be able to really write about something as history, but historians and Americans will be arguing over was this an intentional deception that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq that turned out not to be there as a way to get Americans to support this war? Or was it that Americans can be easily fooled in this day and age? And I say this with the greatest of empathy with my fellow citizens. You know, presidents can say things uh, to Americans that unless they are very clued into what is a falsehood and what is truth, we can go to war under false pretenses. There was a poll taken during the presidential campaign of 2004, I do write about it, I get a little bit into Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you think that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11? And I think the figure, I've got it in the book, is something like 45 42. 42, 42%. which happens to be exactly the same percentage that Trump polls right now. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, I rest my case. <laughs> uh, having brought up Trump, he has remarked that if you want to be considered a great president, which mm. he does, it's easier to do so if you've been commander-in-chief during a war. Is he just stating what everybody knows, or does that make you a little more frightened? Makes you a lot more dangerous to have as president. Uh, TR would have loved to have a crisis that would show his leadership skills. Not necessarily a war, but a crisis. But TR had read a little history and had a deep understanding of and love for democratic ideals. None of this I would say about Donald Trump. This is a narcissist who wants to be seen as a great president. Do you sleep comfortably knowing that he feels that the quickest way to be considered a great president is to have a war? I don't. And I sleep even less comfortably because this is a president who makes the connection between waging wars and winning elections. Uh, he repeatedly in 2011 and 2012 tweeted the prediction that Barack Obama would start a war to get reelected. He didn't but it's a dangerous idea for a president to think of a war as something that's gonna get your poll numbers up and is gonna get you reelected. As bad as the presidents were in some cases that I've mentioned tonight, Polk, you know, I'm frustrated with McKinley, I'm frustrated with Wilson, I'm frustrated with LBJ. As many bad mistakes as they made, none of them did this to win elections. As cynical as we may be, that hasn't happened in American history, they didn't do it to get their polls up. And to have a president who I think is fully capable of that, it's something that really does make me not sleep well enough. Plus, as I was saying earlier, through the 200 years we, we, we began with founders that couldn't possibly conceive of nuclear weapons or terrorist incidents or you know, cyber attacks or biological attacks. They were thinking of old conventional wars, but they worked really hard to make sure that presidents couldn't do that single-handedly, that it would have to be Congress. Now we've come to a situation where it's all in, in the hands of a president. Tonight, if there's, God forbid, a Russian missile coming over the North Pole, it's gonna be Donald Trump who has 15 minutes to decide whether to launch nuclear weapons that could wind up killing upwards of 60 million people and incinerating much of the Northern Hemisphere. It's gonna depend on his character and his st steadiness and his understanding of democracy and the issues involved. And, you know, I but think it's not too much to say that, you know, we're in a terrible situation. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're just about, we'll go to questions quite soon, but you brought it up to, well, we both did kind of to the, to the present, and how much of, you know, you look at what's changed, but when you get to the intervention of technology, whether it's how swiftly communications are, how swiftly... And, and also, and nuclear, Terrence, nuclear if weapons. we ever have a really bad man as president, 
And on war so far, Donald Trump, we have not had. Right. He has not gotten us into a new unnecessary war. But remember if, and I'm not saying this about him because there's not the evidence yet, this is hypothetical. If you ever have a really bad person who wants to start a war, it is not hard to fabricate a terrorist incident. Not hard at all. And any unscrupulous president who knows how quickly Americans united behind a president who was here at the time of terrorism, I mean, yeah. this is very dangerous. And, and I'm not talking about Donald Trump because it hasn't happened yet. May God forbid that it ever does. But, but someday we may have a president who does that. What the point I was going to do, though, was that with the threat of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. in which you you cite something, you know, and you have minutes to decide. The whole thing that, sort of the premise that the founders had, I mean, that genie doesn't go back in the that was That was impossible, and I'm not an idiot. I'm not saying that, you know, if the Russian missile is coming over the North Pole, the president should be convene Congress and have a two-week debate. Of course not. What I'm talking about is something like Iraq. Yes, okay. Something like Persian Gulf War, or something like the Vietnam War a conventional large-scale war, which we are still very much yes. in danger. Anyone seen Donald Trump's tweets about Iran the last couple of weeks or his tweets about yeah. Syria? I mean, this is not what psychiatrists, I think, refer to as a free-floating anxiety. I mean, this could happen. And finally, let me ask, I mean, you said, uh, we already mentioned the fact that you can't really do history for things so recent. I'm, but, I'm pretty much of a purist. Uh, but this, um, what's the, there's a, there's the, um, the, the wars that we are engaged in now that people don't even know about, um, whether it's the, the drone wars, the, the assassinations, the secret ops, Yemen, Somalia, you know, places like that where we're, I mean, this is, this is, it seems to me this is new. Well, and this is where you're really depending on a president who has character and is not impulsive. Because all the things you just mentioned, Terrence, they're approved by a president these days in secret. He's not gonna go to Congress and say, this is what I'm doing with drones, this is what I'm doing with areas of warfare that we don't even know about. And that's why anyone who says, doesn't matter anymore what the character of a president is as long as he appoints good Supreme Court justices and asks for the legislation we want. That's absolutely crazy and reckless. Yeah, I mean, but what I'm saying is that there's, there's, a, there's a, the, the whole, the way that the war, nature of war yeah. has changed makes this, I mean, the person who writes the book you just wrote 50 years from is now. Is going to be writing a story that took pla place largely in secret. In secret, exactly. I mean, for instance, one reason why I can't write about George W. Bush right now, and Barack Obama, right the, by the way, and even Donald Trump, who is a war president. We still have right. at least one war going on, and, re and you could argue even more than that, is because a lot of this is things that we don't know. We don't know what we're doing to fight, you know, what used to be called the war on terrorism, things that are covert, you know, things, you know, various forms of war warfare that aren't public yet. And so that's why it's going to take a while. But, but I repeat, that's why it matters who is president. And I'll, I'll give you the final question, which is that of sort of a linchpin in this is what's happened to the ability or the capacity to declare war. Uh -huh. What it also seems to me Congress has done, as well as it isn't that, the, my reading is the president hasn't stolen this. They well, didn't Congress, want it. They have conceded, they've been lapped off. Yeah. But what they have done uh, in 2001 and then later is these open ended. The worst, the worst. Talk just a bit I about mean, that. I mean, if Congress is going to just say, we don't want any part of this, we'll just let the president rule. Please do not come to me with these flimsy resolutions saying, you know, authorizes the president to use military force. The president can use military force. That's, that genie is already out of the bottle. And the problem, the reason why this, I mean, the reason it began, I tell the story, is that in 1950, June, South, uh, North Koreans invaded the South. 
And Truman said, we've got to use force to restore, you know, to protect South Korea. I'm with him so far. And then his aide said, well, of course, Mr. President, you want, to, you want to go to Congress and ask for a war declaration, just as everyone else has done all the way back to That's 1787. Right. And Truman, whom I otherwise like, but, you know, I don't want a, a ring of hell that is the Wilson level or the Polk level, but maybe an outer ring that's quite, not, not quite so hot. That, and I love Truman in other ways, but Truman says, I don't want to ask Congress for a war declaration because there will be a big political debate and I will be criticized and I can't do it, and guess what? I can't do it because five months from now, I've got midterms. <laughs> and I don't want to jeopardize my party in the midterms with a big, raucous debate. So, you know, hell with Congress. You know, Polk told them what to do, and I'm going to also. So they want to tell me to take these troops home while they're in battle. Go ahead. He said, knowing that they would never do and it. And then called it a UN police action well, rather than it, a US it, it's war. It's even worse than that, Terrence. He didn't call it anything. Oh. <laughs> and as I say in the book, there's a press conference and, and people are saying, do you, uh, you know, reporters are saying, do you intend to ask for a war de declaration? He says, no. So well, what do you call this? You know, what is this, some kind of police action un under the United Nations? And Truman said, that's it, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so to this day, you know, we all read in school, Truman called this a police action under the United Nations. He didn't even take the time to call it anything. That just came from a reporter and he said, fine, you know, you want to call it that, go ahead. Very good. So we were not well led and this led to a deadlock very quickly. And he didn't spin the war as a victory, but people were made to forget Korea very quickly because it wasn't a loss, but it was a stalemate. And because people so quickly forgot what a big mistake Korea was in the way that Truman waged it. Only 11 years yeah. later, Lyndon Johnson asked Congress, not for a war declaration, but a resolution to wage yeah. another land war in Asia. Anyone who had remembered Korea would say not in a million years, but because no one mentioned remembered Korea, they said, go ahead. Uh, those who forget history, blah, blah, blah. Very good. Ted. It is uh, that time of the evening at Live Talks LA. I'd like to remind you that questions typically start with a W or an H, <laughs> sometimes a D. And, and Ted really hopes that you'll give a long pronunciamento that'll last at least 10 minutes, right? <laughs> questions are typically short. Right. <laughs> There is no such thing as a two-part question, right. and only Terence McNally gets to ask follow-up questions. Hi. Um, Hi. I really, well, I won't even start with that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, you're on the news, there are other historians who are involved with journalism. Do, and, and when you say that, you know, there are presidents who read history, that always comforts me. Do you ever get uh, I'm sorry, you said there are presidents who read history, I didn't catch the That last gives one. me some level of comfort when you Thanks. talk about TR or... It gives me comfort that that's comforting to you. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, in today, you know, you're a historian. Do politicians ever consult with you? Do you ever get calls mm. from Congress, people yeah. in Congress, or people in the executive branch? Never, and this should never happen, like, you know, what do I do about ex such and such an issue because... A, I don't think I should be advising politicians anyway. But they do, you know, sometimes uh, get together with historians, not to ask advice, but just to talk more generally. For instance, Barack Obama, and this has been reported, had a dinner about once a year for years with about, I think about maybe six or eight historians, of which I was one for about three hours. And this would never be like, what should I do about Afghanistan? Because that would have been stupid. We couldn't have told him. We don't have that kind of expertise. But he would ask, for instance, is there anything in what you've written about or studied that, uh, that's a parallel for some of the things that I'm doing? So we would talk about our own work. And I think that's sort of a good way for a political leader to use history. And 
I was at similar gatherings with George W. Bush and Bill Clinton and George H. W. Bush. Uh, so it's something that presidents do in one form or another. I mean, with Obama, it was a long dinner. Others, I think Clinton would have historians for dinner. George W. Bush would have them in the Oval Office. You know, different settings. Uh, but I never thought I would live in a country where you had a president who proudly said, not only do I not read history, but I do not read uh, as a badge of honor. I mean, Harry Truman, since I've dumped on him for Korea, may I say a nice thing about him? Uh, he was probably better read in presidential history than almost anyone else. Had no college education. He grew up in Independence, Missouri. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, he couldn't play sports because he had glasses and his parents said, if they, you break them, we can't afford new ones, so no sports. So he said, as a result, instead, I read every book in the Independence Public Library, which I always thought was an exaggeration, but anyone been to Independence, it's, <laughs> it's not a big library. But he said when he was president, he couldn't have functioned without having read history, and the one book he really loved was, horrible title, it was called, Great Men and Famous Women. <laughs> the premise that women had no hope to be great, only famous. This is written in 1895. And he said, you know, I don't, I don't, it was, the subtitle was from Nebuchadnezzar to Sarah Bernhardt, and I don't think he was <laughs> thinking about either of those two, but, he said, when I had to deal with like firing MacArthur or do I use atomic weapons in Japan, I thought of what Abraham Lincoln had been through or Andrew Jackson, and there was never an exact parallel, but it helped me to function because otherwise the decisions you make as president are so tough. So I used to say, I don't want to live in a country with a president who does not read history. <laughs> And I say now, uh, I still want to live in this country, but it really unnerves me to have a president who knows nothing about history and is proud of that. Yeah. How pessimistic right. are you in the future? Uh, I'm not pessimistic because I've read history and I know how much this country has the ability to revive itself, even in a situation like this but I am very nervous about the next couple of months. Uh, I think, and this is, I'm outside of politics, I'm a registered independent, this is not a political comment. I'm nervous about the Supreme Court. One of the greatest moments in our history was U.S. v. Nixon. For those who don't remember that, that was the Nixon tapes case. And it was the summer of 1974, and on the surface, you might have been nervous about the result because Nixon had appointed four of the nine justices and you wow. might be worried that they would feel an obligation to vote in favor of Nixon and that therefore the Supreme Court would rule in his favor. And if Nixon had been able to keep his tape secret, he would have served for eight years and he would have gotten away with one of the biggest scam, scams of all time, which was Watergate. But as it happened, of the four justices he appointed, one, William Rehnquist, recused himself because he had been in the Nixon Justice Department, and the other three justices he had appointed voted against him. So it was a great moment for democracy. It was eight to nothing. They felt that it was important to make a statement. Contrast that with nowadays. We have, and this is a time that justices seem to be more political, uh, there is a five to, th five to four conservative majority with the appointment of Kavanaugh. Uh, I believe the reason why Donald Trump appointed Brett Kavanaugh was not the reasons that we usually hear, was because Brett Kavanaugh has the most extreme fringe view of any of the contenders on presidential power. He says presidents probably should not be subpoenaed they should not be investigated in office. They probably should not be indicted. And if presidents want to use pardons to cover up, that's okay too. That was all music to Donald Trump's ears. I'm convinced that's the reason why he got that nomination 
because Donald Trump is not stupid. He knows that the Supreme Court could very soon have to rule on a case that could mean whether he stays as president or not, or is indicted for criminal offenses. And he wanted to make sure that the person in that crucial fifth slot was someone who had these views that could very well result in Donald Trump getting off. And as you say, uh, many might have been on the same page as Kavanaugh on abortion or guns, right. but he's Which an, is fine. But he's an know, outlier Trump, Trump won on the election, presidential but, power. But this is someone with a very extreme view that could have dire, horrible consequences. And if you have a president who has authoritarian tendencies, as I think Donald Trump does, who may in about a month get a report from a special prosecutor, I have no idea what's in the report, could conceivably charge him with criminal offenses, it could be referred to Congress uh, for impeachment, and that gets to Congress. If you have a Republican House and Senate after the election in two weeks, two weeks from what, tomorrow? What are, yeah. we, are we Tuesday? Yeah. I've been a long time tour, tomorrow. so I forget what day it is. It's Tuesday. Tuesday tomorrow, two weeks from Tuesday. If you have, and I'm not saying this for political reasons, I'm talking this purely in terms of the Constitution and presidential power. If Donald Trump uh, is accused by Robert Mueller, let's say a month from now, and the House is still in Republican hands, uh, there's a very good chance that that report could be deep-sixed. There's a very good chance that Jefferson Sessions, whom I never thought I would come to admire, uh, will be fired, that Rod Rosenstein will be fired, that Robert Mueller will be fired, that you may never see that report, even in the archives, for f until 50 years from now. I hope there's someone here who will be here 50 years from now, and I hope it won't take 50 years to see that report. And the problem would not be that there would be Republicans in control of the House in a month if they win this election, which anyone who saw the polls on Sunday, Donald Trump's popularity rating is at one of its highest levels, according to the NBC Wall Street Journal poll that was revealed on Meet the Press. Could it be just yesterday? That would be Monday just yesterday. Monday night, yeah, so it was just yesterday. Uh, and when a president power is popular, it means his party does better in a midterm. So everyone who's been hearing about a blue wave, there may be no blue wave, and you'd better get out of and vote if you feel strongly about this and register 10 people. Uh, if you feel about the presidential power aspects of this, that this is dangerous. I'm not talking about voting Democratic or Republican. What I'm trying to say is the problem is not the party in control of the White House. The problem is party leaders who will not challenge the president of their own party. Case in point, Lyndon Johnson in January of 1968, something else I found was that his own party leaders were talking in secret about possibly impeaching Lyndon Johnson for the untruths that led to the war in Vietnam. Anyone remember someone named Bill Fulbright? Yes. Oh yeah. The Democratic head of, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was irate at Lyndon Johnson because he hated the war. Lyndon Johnson's majority leader in the Senate was a guy named Mike Mansfield, Montana. Hated the war, challenged Johnson all the time on the war. This thing about these lapdog party leaders in Congress saying yes sir to a president of their own party, this is a new development. You don't see it in American history. It is anti-democratic. It's against what the founders wanted. So what I am objecting, objecting to is not Republican control of Congress per se. The voters should vote for who they want to. This is a democracy, at least at the moment. But the threat to democracy is when you have, and this is what I have seen at least in the last year and a half with Donald Trump, his leaders in Congress are all saying, yes, sir, I will defer to you. I know of people on the, the Judiciary Committee that is chaired by Chuck Grassley. You saw him operate in those Kavanaugh hearings. They said they'd never seen him behave that way before. 
in such a servile way to the President of the United States. So I'm not saying that a Republican House next, next month is a bad thing, but if it's a Republican House that does, does nothing but salam to a president who may have committed grave abuses of power that may, we don't know yet, but they may be described in the Mueller report, that's a danger to our republic. Well, one of the, one of the threads in your book is checks right. and balances, Absolutely. and they are basically acting as no check. Right, so the two checks on Donald Trump abusing power possibly are number one, the Supreme Court, I've described why I think that is a real danger, because Kavanaugh not only has these extreme views of presidential power, but he got confirmed finally after a process in which he became extremely indebted to Donald Trump. And if there's one thing that Donald Trump is good at, he's letting you know where you owe him and making sure that you make sure that you know that debt. Kavanaugh, we know, spent at least a week holed up in the Trump White House with Trump's political handlers saying, tell us your deepest secrets so that we can help protect you against them in the hearings. So that means that Donald Trump knows some of, of Kavanaugh's ah. secrets. That does not exactly suggest that this is gonna be an independent justice on the Supreme Court, even if he has the best of intentions and the House and Senate I've talked about. So all I'm asking for is if you have a president who potentially, hypothetically at the moment, we won't know until there's a Mueller report, if it ever becomes public, but if there's been abuse of power, I want this to be a situation like 1974 where members of Richard Nixon's own party voted for his impeachment. Yeah and justices who were appointed by Richard Nixon voted to demand that his tapes be released. That's all I'm asking for, and I'm extremely anxious that we may not have a working democracy in which that happens. And I think we should all be very nervous. Yeah, time for two Sorry more questions. Sorry to make this evening so <laughs> anxiety-filled, but. Uh, continuing this very cheery conversation. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, do you consider this bully strut that Trump is doing now with the Russians a setup to create a warlike atmosphere for 2020? Uh, getting out of the INF Treaty? Here's the problem. You know, I'm old enough to have lived in a democracy where when a president had a summit with a Russian leader, they would tell you what they did. <laughs> he spent, and they would also have no takers in the room and other diplomats would be a delegation and they wouldn't rely on the Russians' interpreter. <laughs> I have no idea what he said to Putin in Helsinki. Yeah. This is as dangerous as could be. I mean, we have no reason to know, but, you know, I don't know what he asked Putin to do. I don't know if he asked them, him to interfere in the midterm election of... 2018, we may be going into an election in two weeks in which there are big irregularities that are worse than 2016, and in which there's a verdict that 15 days from now we're talking about an election that, that people don't have faith in. We have no idea. And we have a president who talks to Russians in secret. Donald Trump last year, his first visit as president, usually a president goes to Canada or goes to England, Guess where Donald Trump went? He went to Saudi Arabia, and he spent three days there. And he had secret con conversations. Have you seen any readout about what was said and what was done? Uh, I do not know. And maybe a historian 50 years from now may think that there's a connection between that and what the Saudis have done recently. I do not know. But in a, dem a democracy, our presidents are supposed to give us at least some idea of what was said in these meetings, and anyone here who accepts a situation where a president of the United States has these secret meetings and doesn't tell us what, was go what is going on, our democracy is going away very quickly, and we have to demand that these things do not happen. And our final question for the evening. Aren't you enjoying this evening? Uh, I hope everyone's going out to have a nice dinner. Uh, but but I, I have to respond honestly to what people are asking. Okay, this will be a cheer-up or two. Yeah. Um, 
And I promise I'll end with something. You, sure. you mentioned Woodrow Wilson, uh -huh. and uh, we know that he had a stroke. And Mr. His, Mr. Personality, yeah. we always call him. Yeah, uh, member of the KKK. Right, right. Um, he wasn't he had, a member, but he celebrated it. He, uh, he had a stroke. And I believe a major portion of the 25th Amendment was to take that into consideration. Right. Be, and, you know, the, no, we it's know about, no help with we time. think we yeah. know something that Rosenstein might have said or may not have said. Probably in passing. It, it, it seems that when the president's nuts versus when the president's had a stroke, he could just fire the cabinet if, 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 he, th if he thinks, you know, I guess the 25th and Amendment. by the way, Wil Wilson tr started to do that. Yeah. Oh, Because okay. he heard that his Secretary of State had convened the cabinet in his absence, and he was lying paralyzed in bed with a little white beard, not letting anyone know what his condition was, and his wife was running interference. I tell the story in the book. But he found that the Secretary of State had, you know, had the effrontery to convene the cabinet so that the wheels of government had not entirely ground to a halt, and he fired him and replaced him with a lapdog. And, 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 and by the way, just to throw this in, especially if there is a, a leadership of the House next month elected of lapdogs, I'm not going to even say which party it is one way or the other, not only is Donald Trump going to fire these people, but it's most likely that John Kelly will go and Mattis, and they will be replaced by people who will not stand up to Donald Trump at all. Well, uh, diverting a little bit, uh, if he fires Sessions, mm -hmm. well, it's going to take a while for a new AG to be... He can make a recess appointment, Rudy Giuliani. Okay. You're, 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 you're going to be so happy you came tonight. Uh, <laughs> this is possible. I'm not predicting it. But one thing Donald Trump is brilliant at, he has little understanding of a respect for democratic ideals. And if you have that and not much of a sense of shame, and you want to grab power from wherever you can get it, you can go a very long way, and he's really good at that. But that means that we Americans, we cannot be passive citizens. We have to be vigilant. And we have to sleep up seriously with one eye open. And that means we have to vote. We have to demand that our leaders not be lapdogs. And we can't stand for it because you stand for it, you're not going to have a democracy. I mean, the, the one thing the founders always said, you remember. Benjamin Franklin was asked during the Constitutional Convention what kind of a government they had brought, and he said, a democracy if you can keep it. Uh, and that's what he meant, because he knew that it's so much easier for a country to be ruled by dictatorship. Can I tell one story that's you know, <laughs> a little bit more cheerful? Might, might you know, at least be a little bit. Uh, one of the stories I tell in the book that's actually sort of a new story is, Tapes were a big part of Lyndon Johnson's life. As I said, I did these two books on LBJ's secret tapes that went up to, I think, the end of 1965. So I, I listened to all the tapes from the rest of the years and used them in this book. And there's a lot of new stuff in there telling about LBJ during the Vietnam War. And I was talking about emotional breakdowns. Johnson didn't have an emotional breakdown, but he got, I don't want to use the word paranoid, so let's say unnaturally suspicious and angry and vengeful against his enemies. And he's on these tapes claiming that Bobby Kennedy is paying Martin Luther King, who was controlled by communists, to start riots against the Vietnam War to embarrass Johnson. And he's claiming that Chinese communists are stuffing cash into the pockets of William Fulbright, the Foreign Relations Committee, and that's the reason Fulbright against, is against the Vietnam War. And so Johnson was beginning to get, his mind was beginning to get very troubled. And this is all on these tapes. So, spring of 68, uh, Johnson decides not to run, 
partially because Robert Kennedy was running against him. He was worried that Robert Kennedy might defeat him. And so Kennedy asked to see him. And Kennedy goes into the cabinet room and they have this meeting. And Kennedy had heard rumors that Johnson tapes his meetings secretly and uses it against the person who's there. And so Kennedy goes in and he's trying to be nice to Johnson because he wants to sort of disarm Johnson uh, to make sure that, you know, he knows Johnson is going to oppose him, but he wants him to be as benign as possible. So RFK is just straining to say nice things about LBJ, and they detested each other even then. And so Bobby says, Mr. President, you're a brave and dedicated man. And Johnson said, Bobby, can you say that a little louder? <laughs> uh, and so RFK knew that the meeting was being taped. And so it was. And so RFK leaves the cabinet room after this meeting. And, you know, Johnson was trying to get him on tape saying things like he's brave and dedicated, yeah. things that, that LBJ can use in his favor. And uh, he says to his assistant, you know, I want to quickly get a transcript of this meeting so I can look at it. And the assistant, who is still alive and told me the story in June, it was the last thing I put in this book, we just happened to have lunch and he told me the story said the president called me back into the Oval Office and said, well, where's the transcript of this meeting so I can you know, have a record of what Bobby told me, such as I'm brave and dedicated. And so the man's name was Larry Temple. Larry told me, we don't have a transcript because the tape was not made. And Johnson says, well, why the hell was that? And Larry Temple says, true story says, our technicians think that when Bobby Kennedy came in, he was carrying a scrambler. Wow. So, no record. The lives of our saints. <laughs> anyway, could I ask for some applause for Terrence, who has been brilliant, <laughs> as he always is? Thank you so much. Thank for you, Mike. Thank it's you. It's been a great treat for me. Thank you. Great honor. Thank you. thank you. And thank you all for being here.